If you went out and asked a dozen people, who was the greatest prophet in the Bible, you'd probably get a lot of different answers. Somebody might say Elijah. Someone else might say Isaiah. Another person could say Jeremiah. Someone may say Moses. Someone may say Jesus Christ was the prophet. Now, we've been studying the life of John the Baptist, so if I asked those that have been in this for a while here now, who was the greatest prophet, they may say John the Baptist. And that's a good reason why, because Jesus Christ identified him as, of all men born of woman, none was greater than John the Baptist. We've seen the life of John so far from the time of the announcement to Zacharias all the way through the baptism of Jesus Christ and John after that baptism of Jesus Christ pointing out to others that this was the Lamb of God who was sent to take away the sins of the world. John had baptized Jesus Christ and John spoke of Jesus even before that time as being that one who was greater than him, who was sent by God, and who would save mankind. John's ministry was one of calling men back to God, of preparing the way for God and for salvation, and that salvation that Jesus Christ would bring. And he testified of that, and he testified of Jesus Christ. After that time, there is a period of time where the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ overlap. It's not like John baptized Jesus and Jesus said, Okay, John, I've got it from here. You can just go back to the desert and eat in your locusts or honey and whatever else you were doing. There's an overlap. There's an overlap. And... We won't look there, but just for your reference, in John chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 21, there are a series of events that are recorded of what Jesus Christ was doing while John was still around baptizing people. It's during that time that Jesus finds more disciples. His first couple of disciples were gained through John the Baptist. John said... There's the one I was talking about. There's the, the lamb that's here to take away the sins of the world. And one of his disciples, a couple of his disciples say, okay, well, we're going to follow him then. And that was, one of those was Andrew who got Peter. And then after that, the next two disciples that are mentioned are Philip and Nathaniel. From there, Jesus Christ went to Cana and he performed his first miracle. How many of you know what that one is? Water into wine. Water Pretty famous, right? <laughs> then he spent a few days in Capernaum. After that, he went to the, to the temple for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's on that occasion that he drives out the animals out of the temple and chases out the money changers because they, as he said, had made his father's house a den of thieves. All of these things happen while John is still around baptizing people. After that, Jesus Christ meets with Nicodemus. And that whole wonderful record in John chapter 3 of Jesus Christ speaking to Nicodemus. John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world. That's all in that period of time. And all these things happen while John's still in business. We'll pick it up then in chapter 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anan near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So, Jesus Christ is with his disciples in one place, and it says that he baptized, but we're going to learn more about that in just a minute. John's in another place, and he's still baptizing people. 
And again, the purpose of baptism was a symbolic washing away or cleansing of their sin. It was a ministry, John's ministry, a ministry of repentance, you know, people recognizing they needed to change their course, and that water baptism was showing that they had been forgiven. Verse 24, for John was not yet cast into prison. Would have been more difficult to do that had he been cast into prison. So we're seeing timing here. We're seeing that there is this period before John's arrested where the two of them are both carrying out their ministries at the same time. Verse 25, Then there arose an equ a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So these guys come to John and say, what's going on? We don't know, what, you know what's happening here. The same one that you pointed out, the one you baptized, and you pointed out that he was the one that was sent, he's in another place, and he's baptizing people. And his disciples, they're baptizing people, and you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, it appears from this, what we're reading here in John chapter 3, that not only John was baptizing, but also that Jesus Christ was baptizing. And that's a little confusing considering that, Jesus, that John said that Jesus Christ's baptism would be a baptism with the Holy Spirit. That John was baptizing with water, but that Jesus Christ would be baptizing with Holy Spirit. And yet it appears from this as though Jesus Christ is also baptizing with water. But you'd get there if we just kept reading, but we'll skip a bit and we'll come back to the context. In chapter 4 of John, in verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard, that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Here again, looks like Jesus is doing more baptizing than John. Next verse. Though Jesus himself baptized not. Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Jesus Christ wasn't doing any of the actual baptizing. Some of his disciples were. Now, two things about that. One is recognize the difference between disciples and apostles. A lot of times people don't. A disciple is just a disciplined follower. The apostles were 12 specific men that were chosen <laughs> to carry out a specific job. All apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. It's like all dogs are animals, but not all animals are dogs. Okay. So these are not necessarily his apostles that are doing this, but some of his disciples, some of which had previously been whose disciples? John, John the Baptist. So these guys are into baptizing, and they're just continuing to carry this out. But Jesus Christ himself was not baptizing anybody. All right, back to verse 27 chapter 3. So, they've come, his, John's disciples have come to him about this question. John just is answering their question based on the information they have given him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So he's answering the question very rightly, but he's not, you know, dealing with this. All he's saying is, not sure, you know, what you're telling me, but what I can tell you is, 
nobody can do anything except God's telling them to do it. If, you know, if, if he was doing that, then that's what God wanted him to do. And he calls Jesus Christ the bridegroom and himself the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus Christ was the bridegroom and the bride was the church of Israel. And I won't get into this in much detail here, but it never speaks about the believers today being the bride. We are the body of Christ, not the bride of Christ. That was specifically a term used with Israel. Verse 30. He, speak, referring to Jesus Christ, must do what? Increase. Increase but I must what? Decrease. Decrease. So John recognizes that the ministry of Jesus Christ is just going to get bigger, and his ministry is going to become less and less important. It's going to diminish. That he's coming to the end of what God sent him to do, and Jesus Christ is just getting started. He is just getting started here. And although there is this overlap, during this period of overlap, Jesus Christ will eclipse John's ministry. He will, what, he, what he's doing will be so much greater than what John's doing. John was okay with that. He knew that this is what God's plan was. Verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man received, receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony hath set, hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So this is John's test, further testimony about Jesus Christ and explaining to them just the shift that's going on here. Turn to Luke chapter 3. After this period of their ministries overlapping, after this time, then John is arrested. And that's where what causes the overlap to stop. Luke chapter 3, verse 18. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people, speaking about John. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Above, above all the other evils that Herod did, the worst was he arrested John. And that's going to lead to a whole other series of events. But we'll not follow through on that yet because there's a period of time that if you just read this all together, it looks like John gets arrested, and then the next day there's a dinner banquet and things start happening. But there's a period of time where John is in prison and Jesus Christ is still doing things and John hears about it. Look at chapter 7 of Luke. Luke 7, verse 16. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen amongst us, and that God hath visited his people. And, his rumor, and this rumor of him went throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now, <clears throat> Jesus Christ now is gaining fame. He's gaining fame. And this happens while John is in prison. It says that he called his two disciples. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read this to you. The corresponding record in Matthew 11, verse 2 says, 
Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and then asked them, is this, you're the one that was come or are we supposed to be looking for somebody else? It kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it, why John would even send the two disciples to ask that question. He baptized Jesus Christ. He heard the voice of God. He, you know, testified himself that this was the one who came. And now after hearing about these things, he sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus Christ, are you the one that was, is come to be the Messiah? Or is there somebody else still coming? Why did John do that? You know what? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. So my speculation, somebody else's guess, is all irrelevant. If the Word of God doesn't say, as much as you'd like to know some things, if it doesn't say, it doesn't say. And nobody has the right to just guess. Nobody's got the right to guess. You know, you can say, oh, maybe it's because, you know, he was expecting the Savior to do certain things, or maybe it's because someone, who knows? One of those things that when, you, when Jesus Christ gathers us all together, you know, I'm sure we all have all of our questions that we'll want to ask him, that we'll want to ask God, and, and that can be one of them. In the meantime, we just read the record. Verse 20. When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John, saying, I can't believe he came and asked that question. I can't believe he sent these guys. What nerve? No, no. Obviously, John wasn't doing this out of an rejection of Jesus Christ or a matter of unbelief, or Jesus Christ would not go on to say the things he says here. Verse 24, continuing. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? <laughs> you know, what did you go to see? Just somebody that was just blowing about in the wind? Or some guy that was living the life of luxury in his soft raiment and being recognized and extolled by all the higher-ups? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. <laughs> the guys that do that, you know, the ones in king's courts, they wear the fine clothes, they eat the fine foods, they're treated like kings. But that wasn't John. Verse 26, but what went ye out for what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So, see, that wasn't just my opinion. <laughs> That's what Jesus Christ said. You know, it's funny, again, like men's estimation. Men's opinion, the way that men see things and judge things. You know, if you, people would pick Elijah or Isaiah, and you know, why they might choose some of these guys would probably be based on different things they had read about them doing. Look at all the great miracles Elijah did. He must be the greatest. Or, you know, Elijah did twice as many, so he must be twice as good. People judge things one way. And all, as wonderful as all of that is, it's not the way that God judged it. It's not the way that Jesus Christ judged it here. 
He said that John was greater than all the others. Verse 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. <laughs> and the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. In the marketplace in the East, Children would sit and they'd play flutes, they'd play other instruments, and people would dance. And if they played a happy song, then they'd dance. And if they played a sad song, then they'd cry. And whatever tune was played, they danced to that tune. And that's what Jesus Christ said these people are like. They just dance to whatever tune somebody wants to play for them. And that's how most people were, and still are. Most people dance to whatever tune's played for them. And don't think any more about life or what they should be doing than that. Verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold a gluttonous man, a wine bibber. John didn't eat or didn't eat or drink, and you said he's He's possessed with a devil spirit. Mm -hmm. I ate, I drank, and you said, why, that guy's nothing but a glutton and a drunk. <laughs> no matter what, you're going to find some reason to criticize, right? Some way the people will just pick. Because these are the ones, the ones that were doing this, the ones he's reproving here, were the ones who had no interest in repenting. Who, when John came with his baptism of repentance, rejected him and rejected that because they didn't need that. They were so self-righteous. They were so holier than thou. Who needed that? Why, they were the great religious leaders. So they had no need of any of that. But Jesus Christ says, you know, well, next verse. <laughs> God says, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of all her children. Truth will prove out. Truth will prove out. And it was obvious in their works. It was obvious in what they did. It was obvious in what the course they took when they rejected John and when then they rejected Jesus Christ, that these were not men who really cared about the things of God. These were not the ones that really had any heart for God or His Son. Go to Mark chapter 6. Well, they so didn't have any love for John or Jesus Christ, that the events unfold where John is not only now in prison, but he's murdered. And that's recorded in, John, in Mark 6, as well as other places, but we'll read it there in verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, heard of him being Jesus Christ, to give you context here, okay? Herod hears about Jesus Christ. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I am beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So when they hear about Jesus Christ, there's a lot of different opinions going. And a lot of those opinions center on the fact that a lot of the people in this time and place believed in reincarnation. So they thought, somebody said, why, it's, it's John. Herod himself thinks it's John the Baptist risen from the dead, and now he's, he has now become Jesus Christ. He's now this man, and he's doing these things. And somebody else is saying, no. This is the reincarnation of Elijah or some other prophet, whatever one that they thought was the greatest, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if I'll get there. Um, we'll see. <laughs> Too much of a sidetrack. We'll keep reading. Verse 17. For... 
Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. That's recalling past events that are happened. This is how he came to arrest John, because John, as we read before, reproved him about taking his brother's wife. And now, after John already has already been beheaded, he's recalling the events that led up to that. Verse 20, For Herod feared John, no, I skipped a verse, 19, Therefore Herodias, which is Herod's wife, had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. But when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. She must have been quite a dancer, huh? <laughs> so he has this big party. He has this big party, and his wife's daughter, you know, from his brother, um, she dances. And Herod's, wow, that was such an amazing dance. Ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. You name it, you got it, just because I'm so impressed here. Verse 24, and she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? What do you want me to get? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightly, straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by, which means immediately, in a charger, the head of John the Baptist. Wow. How how evil, how wicked these people are. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with them, meaning he didn't want to look bad, that he went back on his word, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison, and he brought and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse, corpse and laid it in a tomb. On, you know, the whim of this mother and this daughter, the dance, John is beheaded. Beheaded because, because he spoke the truth. Because he spoke the truth and they didn't want to hear it. You know, sometimes people think, oh, I had, you know, somebody made fun of me. <laughs> I spoke the truth and they laughed at me. Well, think about some of this stuff. As you continue reading, well, we'll go to Luke, Luke chapter 9. Verse 18. And it came to pass, as he, Jesus Christ, was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and some say that one of the old prophets is risen again. Same thing that he heard that Herod was saying. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Jesus Christ is proclaiming who he is. And again, you have all this wild, crazy speculation. And all this speculation because they did believe in reincarnation, but... Nonetheless, Jesus Christ made it clear who he was, just as John had also testified of him. The ministry of John was a far-reaching ministry. You read about it in the, all the way into the book of Acts, that that fame of John had spread everywhere. It had spread everywhere, and it had a profound effect on the lives of people everywhere in preparing them for God and what the salvation Jesus Christ brought. God bless you.